uh, in the tenth script. Um, a, a good way to start these meetings, I think, is uh, what should we talk about? What what thing do you want to bring uh, to this meeting about chapter three? We'll we'll start doing more of that, I think. For me, it's about gaps from the record. Um, there's something, you know, there's a whole lot of um, spaces that people are filling in with, I, I guess, conjecture. And it's just interesting watching somebody say that about millions of years of history. <laughs> 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 but how um, actually raising the fact that there is a gap is actually a useful thing mm -hmm. and working with it. And I know that's a bit meta, but I think to a certain extent, it's like being playful with that as a conversation that is part of the book. And it's what he's obviously leading chapter three in with. Um, gaps are important. They're important to recognize, not necessarily fill with guesses, but there's something about the, the quality of the narrative, the guesses that is actually useful. Questioning that and um, bringing attention to it. Um, gaps, questioning that, bringing attention. Yeah because it forces us, um, and I've just recently read the passage where he said, look, you know, <laughs> we might know a little bit about the last few years <laughs> in the scheme of things, but there's millions of years before that that we don't. And um, there are real tensions, or there should be real tensions in what that means in terms of our openness to accept other sort of narrative. Um, and and do you think there's so I have to admit <laughs> I haven't read chapter three um, I feel bad but um, time has gotten away from me and so uh, I have no idea what it. we're talking about I'm coming back to it and um, I do have chapter three in front of me at the moment on my iPad um, I was thinking I would bring it up too I I wonder it it reminds me just talking about gaps reminds me a little bit of um, uh, one of the calls for chapter two, um, somebody was talking about, it was odd that um, that Graeber and Wengro started, like they, they started talking about Rousseau, the Rousseau area, but a lot of the change had already happened, um, you know, like 80, 100 years prior kind of. So he thought it was odd that they started where they did um, yeah. without really acknowledging that there was a gap that they you know they just didn't talk about so i thought that was interesting so you're talking about their they talked about gaps did you also see that they had gaps that they, they didn't talk about no that? and i think it's probably because i'm not doing that close reading yeah. Um, what I'm trying to do is get the gist of a very big book, which Dave Snowden claims should have been a third of the length, <laughs> listening to a couple of the videos to try and get a sense of the person or the people who wrote it. And David Wengro is a, a, get, is a gap for me, but also um, listening to some of the other materials helps me get a sense of the person and the tone and their approach to what is a rather large um story to be told about his storytelling and his narrative because the the mechanisms and the ways that you bring challenges like you know the story of humans to the table is actually part of the um area of criticism or um discussion or whatever that we need to really take in because you know I'm, I'm really interested in narrative and the quality of the narrative mm -hmm. what he's done is he's made attractive or open for discussion the the challenge of looking at the story of humans across millions of years and to do that you've got to leave things out we've already left things out as a species in general I mean you know th th there's a lot of things that you know that had been left out for him to even be motivated to tell the story 
And then you've got, as an author, you've got to leave things out to be able to tell the story still. So I think part of what's coming up for me is the challenge of telling the story as a narrator is something that really needs to be also respected in this and and who are the people who are choosing to do it and what shortcuts have they had to take to even make it feasible Now, we don't have to deal with that now. It can be a progressive thing, but he's actually talking about that in Chapter 3 because I came back to the beginning of Chapter 3, I yep. guess, to refresh my mind, and it was at the beginning of my journey with the Davids. <laughs> um, Klaus, what do, you, what do you think? Do you have uh, things you want to talk about about Chapter 3? Yeah, what, what struck me here is it's really an exploration of leadership styles, uh, of, of styles of organizing a society into a cohesive functioning unit. And when you think about it, that, that experiment hasn't concluded yet, right? Because even today, you know, you have uh, author an, an authoritarian impulse where you have a top-down command structure that uh, forces compliance with a you know, the general with a, a central direct, directive and direction versus a uh, um, versus a society that allows um, a distributed power, a distribution of power, autonomy uh, of, of uh, power centers and individuals even. And throughout history, there has always been this back and forth where um, how do you, how do you lead, right? And the majority of time uh, um, has been through coercion. I mean, the the uh, no, at least in the uh, uh, um, in the re in recorded history, right? I mean, in in the practical examples that we have, um, and then there have been some isolated examples like the Spartans and so on, but even those where only partial because you know, maybe 20% of the population actually qualified to be members of this of this free group, the rest were slaves and enslaved people who, who were in servant positions. So, so I think the, the, the challenge is sort of an evolutionary uh, uh, path where um, in, in order to really release the creativity and the and the full dispersed power of, 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 a, of a large group of people, um, there has to be on the one hand unity in purpose, but on the other hand, uh, diversity in, in, uh, in, 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 in discharging your, your societal function, if that is a fair way to say it. What I love from you making that point, Klaus, is the fact that um, at the time all of this was playing out, humans pretty much lived in context and they were forced to deal with it. Whereas our technologies over time have evolved to a way where we can pretend that um, in our day-to-day -day lives, we don't have to deal with context. I mean, it's cooler, I've got the air conditioner on, I'm nice and warm and toasty, I can make that decision. but that decision was my decision. I had the technology at my fingertips to do it. And I could ignore the fact that it's cold outside in my city. And it's taken us, you know, millions of years to get to that point. But it means that our leadership structures don't have to reflect at all the context that we're in. I don't have to go and find wood for a fire, but I could, I know how to do it. Um, I don't have to rub sticks together and do any of those things. I can act as an individual and it allows me to stay distant from my context for a long enough to believe that really it, it's not a context. <laughs> the context makes me all powerful. I don't have to consult anyone. I'm not locked in with anyone else for the winter with no way of being warm, um, as opposed to free ranging over the hills in summer where I can do and act a different way. Um, so, you know, leadership 
and actions around decision making are all context sensitive. And I love the way this was quoted by Dave Snowden in one of the yarns that I'm looking at at the moment. Um, in fact, they discussed Graeber's book, referred to chapter two more than chapter three. But this um, topic of being um, able to have multiple leadership structures and how they were seasonal, I think it's absolutely essential that we don't have to do it now, or we pretend we don't have to do it. So when it's a, a hot planet or a cold planet, we still flip the air conditioner. <laughs> if we can't go where we want to go, there's no argument. You take your second car and you go where you want to go. So we split out the requirement to actually deal with the constraints um, by using technology to make the discussion not necessarily one of that there's going to be tension around. What I got out of this seasonal type of leadership where during the hunting season, there's one style of, of leadership where, where versus in the uh, um, abundance, uh, 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 in the, whatever other season they have. So there are two seasons, basically. One is of abundance during the summer when uh, you know, crops are ready and prepared and game is available versus the winter time. And there are two very different social arrangements between those two periods in these uh, 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 now in indigenous cultures, ancient cultures. And I would describe this as situational leadership. Mm -hmm. you know? so, so there is an, a, a, a situational adaptation. And in some ways you could argue we have that today, right? I mean, in a wartime, you need different types of leadership than you do in peacetime and yeah. at times of abundance versus times of scarcity, right? So um, we don't necessarily have a formulation for that. I mean, we don't have a conscious way of restructuring our leadership style to adapt and accommodate to a situational uh, uh, need, right? I mean, it, it's, it always seems to come to breakage first before anything changes. Well, I, th I think the assumption, there is a difference there. Um, the And know that I've actually had a conversation with Ken Blanchard, I think it was, who was one of the people who looked at situational leadership, I actually have met him and discussed this point very briefly. Um, and I've, I've seen um, an example of how that goes well or badly in one of my volunteering roles, and I won't say which one, but it disappoints me when I see it, is that while there is the requirement to have different leadership styles according to um, the situation, what often happens is it's the expectation is that one person themselves will swap heads. They don't necessarily move sideways to another person. The structures are, are fallible in that it's one person responding differently as opposed to different people in different situations and the shift between that and the recognition of the need to shift it is often not met in modern times because of the way the structure is set up um so anyone who fills into steps into that gap is actually at risk because they're still responsive to the old structure the one that or the the formal structure but the there's a difference between um actually just doing the work and doing the work with the authority to do it. Um, and that that's a really important conversation, the difference between power and authority. One other point I want to make is that the ability to reflect on the impact of what I just said is in a creative way where you could all, you know, say, hey, this isn't working situationally. We should have a different leadership style for this versus that um the indigenous voices that i'm listening to they're saying that we've lost we've lost a lot of our downtime you know when you are in in winter and you're also we got it in COVID a bit actually i think which was lovely to see was one of the positive things is that people actually made the time to stop and slow down and think about some of these issues in terms of how we actually set up our leadership for seasonality or you know people just took things into their own hands because there was no script to follow and there wasn't a leader who could tell us what it was. 
they were all finding it. So I think COVID is a really interesting contrast there, how leadership actually got, you know, and that's a modern times thing, you know, do X, but people did Y because Y actually worked and X didn't. And eventually everything sort of fell into line. Oh, we should use masks. <laughs> At the beginning it was like, don't use masks. So there's a historical backwards and forwards. I'd like to make sure that our conversation isn't just looking at the past, but seeing how that's in the present. So you're right, situational leadership is key. The US military is actually the most advanced organization to, to test um, uh, these new concepts. I mean, most of corporate uh, governance today stems for military planning, you know, particularly in the post-war. Uh, the, the organizational structures and so on, many, much of it comes from the military. And the US military is structured and organized to adapt itself to situational challenges. I mean, you can see that right now in the Ukraine, how they guided the Ukrainian military to deflect you know, a much larger force uh, simply by, by by changing tactics and and, 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 and strategy, so so that that um, how 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 to translate the this this situational adaptation, you know, into a political uh, structure um, that that really hasn't worked out yet. Uh, I'm, I'm not aware of of a. Uh, of an example, and there isn't there isn't one in the third chapter for for sure um, that would that would allow these adaptations you know, to to different situations. Other than to say that intuitively, um, these indigenous tribes seem to have worked out a way to have at least two situational adaptations. You know, depending on summer versus winter season, but how how to how to bring that structure uh, to um, into the political process where you have a targeted adaptation to you know, a different uh, economic uh, or power scenario um, that would be that would be uh, something as I, I don't think we have achieved yet. Um, I think it's sort of happening a little bit now. Um, you know, in in the sort of digital fluid, I know what is it? Um, not digital democracy, but fluid democracy sort of space. Um, but I don't think that the mechanism for actually shifting in there has got there. Um, <clears throat> and I, I keep on coming back to the situations that it seems to appear in is where there's this really tight constraint. So if you're, you know, you've got the ice age and you've got, you know, or you've got not enough water or you've got, um, a war or something like that, it's really easy to see the constraint. Like, you know, being you're being bombed. <laughs> you're gonna act now a local, aren't you? You know, it's like, okay, I can't just put it up in an umbrella here. Um, what's interesting, I think, is that the world or other people can ignore some of these things. So, you know, if I say warming planet, it's like it's not warming because I can put my air conditioner on. Hey, what are you talking about? I can deflect it. Um, I think you've got to have some really harsh ex um, environments around and over time get into the rhythm of dealing with them. But here's Gil. It's nice to see you, Gil. Hi, Wendy. Hi, everybody. Sorry to be late. And sorry to be leaving early. My meeting schedule today got scrambled. <clears throat> could, I, could I just comment a couple of things on what I've just heard? Um, Klaus, the thing we're talking about, about the way the, the adaptive strategies of the US military and, and some corporations, <clears throat> my impression is that the not-for-profit universe really lags on that <sighs> and is living in very old models of military structure that are much more command and control and the sorts the military has had to adapt from. And <clears throat> my, my favorite story of this was I was at a, uh, <clears throat> oh, golly. I was scholar in residence at Bainbridge Graduate Institute along with the US Army General. And he blew my mind because he talked about situational leadership in a way that my 1960s brain did not expect from him. 
and he made it very concrete. He said, imagine there's a platoon on patrol and there's you know, 20 or 30 people out with full packs and weapons and they're marching down a road and the leader steps on a landmine and he's blown to smithereens. Any one of those other people has to be able to step into leadership and number one, be competent and number two, be trusted by everybody else. Hmm. They have to train for that kind of capacity. It's a harsh example, but I thought it was, for me, it was enormously illuminating about how to have that kind of dynamism, um, you know, analogous to the lead bird on a migrating, migrating fowl V that, you know, the lead bird swaps out again and again and again, other birds take that role. To the, to the thing, Wendy, that you were talking about, <clears throat> yeah, the lack, of a, the lack of a shared perceived crisis is clearly part of the problem. We all have, all have very different senses of what's going on and what the mess is. Uh, but also in the, I imagine in the communities that Graeber's talking about, people belong to those communities and they knew they belonged to those communities. Mm. And if I'm, in, if I'm in a band of 80 people moving from season to season between this landscape and that landscape, you know, we count on each other. And in a, in a, in a certain real way that at least in this society, we seem to not do anymore. Mm. Uh, and we're not, and we're not clear what we, you know, each of us is not clear what we belong to, who we belong to, where our commitments are. And it's hard to have common purpose without that. Mm. And what's really interesting is that, and this is a real life experience for me, I'm not going to name the organization, but there's a tension in the organization. So there's a, a local response and need. It's actually behaving it because it's forced to behave as a distributed autonomous organization where people stick up for each other in the way that, um, and I'll, I'll mention, Stan, mention Stanley McChrystal's book here, Team of Teams, um, because that's where a lot of this is described. Um, we're behaving like that, but we're forced because there is a command and control structure above us when we fail according to their um, standards, because we're put in a situation where we will fail according to their standards. There's a, as an outside referencing, say, of all risk being managed and under control. And so you get shoot the messenger when you get someone from the, the local camp, whereas actually you've traded through, you've done the things, you've done amazing things over a really long time. But the minute you put your flag up and say, look, there's a mismatch between what external leadership, which is command and control. And in this organization, it came from a command, it came from a military background. Um, what, what you can achieve according to the expectations externally well, is mismatching um, what is actually feasible inside. So people are doing the doing, they're doing the thing, they're, they're actually doing the master mission, but sometimes there are some things that just don't quite fit in the system. Anyone who comes from that system out and says, hey guys, pay attention, gets shot because, wow, you broke the code. <laughs> you didn't actually break the mission, you be, be, did break the code they expected you to follow because they can't pass the tension. We live the tension. And still succeed at the top level you still succeed so anyway risk management and decision making i think you know the risk is actually not having anyone who's doing the mission because anyone who says it's difficult gets shot um you know if you've got a group of people in a hut to go back to to graber and it's winter and it's cold outside we were watching game of thrones last night that's cold <laughs> you've got to work it out if you've got the ability to get out of that, you've got more choices. If you're forced to deal with it because the constraints are such that no one can move until you do, um, it gets a bit violent. And I think that's part of the point that he was talking about, actually. There's something about violence in there that's creeping in as part of the culture. Um, and I, 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 I'm interested, I think, in, in how violence turns up. The, the tensions are managed before it gets to a leadership thing, something about how we hang out together. Um, and I love Dave's thinking on this, Dave Snowden's thinking on this as well, is that you've got to deal with the entanglement of people um, and someone, you either do that culturally or somebody tells you how to deal with it. Pete, you're only being a record court keeper at the moment. 
<laughs> I'm looking for the. <laughs> I, I don't actually, um, I don't have a lot of content for this chapter because I didn't read it. Which chapter are we in? Uh, chapter three. Well, I have it up in front of me. I think you have a lot to contribute. I mean, we're trying to self-organize um, is, is part of it. But, you know, the, and social inequality, you know, it, it turns up. Um, and it turns up in really interesting ways in the ways that different people handle that social inequality. When you spin out the uh, the idea of context or situational specific uh, leadership, um, uh, maybe we need to define situational. I mean, what what uh, is the difference of situational uh, fifty thousand years ago versus today or in the Middle Ages? And uh, one obvious thing is the number of people that are being uh, uh, shepherded together. So even in the Egyptian Empire or in, in uh, subsequent empires, there were tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people you know, that uh, were being governed. So at that point, it becomes <clears throat> a lot more complicated to keep everything uh, uh, together, so to speak, to, to, to maintain a common mindset, uh, you know, a common purpose, and to communicate that common purpose. Um, so so uh, in today's world you know because of the um, increasing level of communication uh, technology we can instantaneously communicate with very large volume numbers of people across time zones across spaces um, and so that 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 um, that is a shift in the situation of form uh, having to maintain control over large numbers of people to do, uh, to, to work in collaboration towards a, a pre-designed outcome, whatever that is from a leadership perspective, versus today where you can really work with decentralized uh, uh, groups and you can, you, you can have an autonomous uh, form of leadership. Uh, that was just not 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 possible. So, th so when you go way back into these tribal units, they were small enough to to be able to communicate, you know, their their um, intentions and their directions throughout the group. And then in the middle, you have formations way too big to uh, um, to be led in any other way than in some authoritarian top down format. And we now have an opportunity you know, to return to a decentralized autonomous form of governance because we can we can communicate uh, instantaneously. Hey Ken, welcome. Hello everybody. Nice to Hi. see you all. Sorry to be late. I was on a client call. Um, That's good. <laughs> Yes, paid paid work is always good. I'm I'm happy when I have paid work. Uh, so um, I came in in the middle here, and and um, someone want to catch me up or where we are, or, should, or just what's 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 going on? Uh, we're we're kind of chatting about uh, chapter three, and uh, we've talked a lot about uh, seasonal leadership and situational leadership. Um, I was I was grabbing a passage um, from the book, uh, page 109. Uh, the Plain Indians were conscious political actors, keenly aware of the possibilities and dangers of authoritarian power. Not only did they dismantle all means of exercising coercive authority, the moment the ritual season was over, they were also careful to rotate which clan or warrior clubs got to wield it. Anyone holding sovereignty one year would be subject to the authority of the others in the next. Mm. I think I'm going to have to get myself a, a, a different copy. I just, I've been listening to the book. So I go back, I make <laughs> clips and I listen and I type stuff out that I've heard. And, uh, but it's so much easier if I had a, a, a copy that I could actually look at. And um, yeah. I was fascinated by seasonality and I was really fascinated by this, this whole idea of, you know, there's no single pattern in some tribes. Women would rule for one month and the men and some would be seasonal and all these different things. And the question of, you know, 
how did we get stuck in this idea that some of us are better than others? And I mm-hmm. love the whole thing about the um, uh, the Buffalo Police of the Plains Indians, and you know, uh, so th- this is this is a really big question for me. Uh, you know, why are we stuck here, and how can we recover that sense of it does not have to be that some of us are better than others? And you know, uh, I sent Pete some questions this morning that I typed out from uh, actually from chapter two of um, you know why are the Europeans um, so mean? Why don't they share food? Why aren't they generous? Why do they um, submit themselves to the orders of others? And like, yeah, I I have to say, I'm really finding myself leaning much more towards anarchy, having (laughs) been reading this book than I was before. So it's it's definitely having an impact. Yeah. Um, One of the things I think we should introduce here, and again, this is in the yarns that I've been exposed to, is the role of matrilinearity in all of this because um, examples are given in that context of where you know the, the you know the men are placed off the fire when there's a when there's a question to answer it so women will sort it out the guys will be looked after they've given an activity to go off and do while the women sort it out and then the debate happens in another place and there are a lot of um, structures in matrilineal sort of setups and I'm um, I'm not really clear about matrilineal versus matriarchy, but I think there is actually something to be said there, um, where the informal power structure is the one that allows the other one to sort of exist, if that makes sense, because there are certain things that have to be managed before you go into another realm and then negotiated through um, soft power. But, you know, Snowden's really clear that in you know, in a Welsh Indigenous society, and it is an old one, it's the mam who rules. It's, it's the mother. Snowden the would mam. be clear on that, wouldn't he? He would, he would indeed. <laughs> and, and what's really interesting is he, he surrounds himself as a current leader with lots of women. But it's, you know, Dave's got some very strong thoughts about different things, but you can see him stepping back and leaving a gap. And we started with the role of gaps. Um, leaving a gap for someone else to put power in and what's really interesting in is when these things are not certain and a lot of things like COVID and that haven't been certain a lot of words are said in there and they're they're sort of feeling their way into what the nature of the problem is so there's something here about language and a shared language that allows people to negotiate things in different ways and then um and this yarning is an indigenous thing so I keep on coming back to Graeber if you had to discuss it in your own language that had its own set of circumstances and then exchange that with someone else, you actually find there's a lot more nuance in what's going on. If you have to do it between a sort of male versus a female powered situation, which is one where they've created a context that's different. I think, I think this is what's happening for me. There's something about having another language you can talk it in, talk about it in, which has other affordances and you know the male versus female um, air quotes around that so you've created a context an entanglement which is dave snowden's idea too where you've got three people who are from different backgrounds you're forced to talk about the hard things because there is no other way of doing it (laughs) you know by by splitting things out and creating some tensions and then recombining it you know the soft versus the hard power the this language versus that language and having that arrangement then when you come back you've got more choices so you've got more things that you can put on the leader's table um and you're not so stuck but i think there's something here about us being individuals and insisting that you know this is this is the right way it's all about men or it's all about women or it's all about countries or whatever that's the wrong size it's the wrong fit and then we've also got ourselves into a bind it's like a double bind where we're so busy that we aren't actually thinking about the fact that it's the wrong fit and we don't have the language to be able to deal with that because English doesn't have all the words in it that it should or needs to um should is the wrong word but you know we don't that variety when taken to an international context um we're not really fit for dealing with it properly you know we don't we know we need to but structuring that leadership 
um, with the tools we've got is actually quite hard because we don't have the languages. We don't have the common words. We don't have the agreements about soft power versus hard power. We could do it sort of locally. The minute you put your head up, it's like, whoa, you can't do that because the other structure is so entrenched. Sorry, I'm just reading what Pete put on the chat here while I process what you just said, Wendy. Um, there's a, this is kind of the definition of a wicked mess in the sense that men see things one way, women see things the other way, and they can't agree on how to look at them. And if it's sort of the original wicked mess, everything kind of flows from that of, I refuse to acknowledge and legitimize your point of view. It's my way, right? And from there, we just get into more and more complexity and things kind of go downhill. And um, that's why I really like the conversation about seasonality in the book and how um, in some, as I've just mentioned, in some uh, tribes, women ruled, you know, one month at a time than the men and others, they'd have seasons. And then sometimes there'd be um, one sided rule for, most of the time, then there'd be festival seasons when everything got turned upside down. And I see that as a uh, as a way to um, keep the crack wide open for more light to come in. You know, when you get locked down into this is how it is, there's never any, way for, any room for change. And when you can say, you know, the day after Christmas, the servants are in charge or the children are in charge, then that allows for an influx of new clean energy to come in and, and sort of rebalance things and reposition. Um, and then we add sex to the whole thing, you know, and it really gets complicated because um, <laughs> there's all the jealousy and, and it's okay in certain cultures during festivals to have sex with whoever you want. And then when the festival is over, you go back to your partner and not everybody ha has monogamy. I mean, there's just, there's this, this huge range of, of um, ways in which we are acculturated and taught to think. And this huge range of, of what's actually gone on before that we're unaware of and what might be worth recovering from our, our ancient past or even not so ancient past. And I have to just say one more thing. There was an article today in uh, the Washington Post about uh, the leaked draft of overturning Roe v. Wade. And he's relying on um, Judge Hale, who was actually the, a, a magistrate who put a couple women to death for witchcraft um, and who has had enormous influence in American jurisprudence of, uh, and I'll send this to anybody who wants it, um, uh, that to this day, there's 21 states that that um, treat marital rape differently than regular rape, and they have more lenient things. And Hale was of the opinion that a man could not rape his wife because by contract, she had surrendered herself to him and therefore was subject to his whim. Well, now we get into the whole thing of equality. And if I, if you're now my property and I can do anything out with you, there's no equality. That's slavery. So that takes us down a whole nother yeah. rabbit hole. Yeah. Um, so yeah, equality and slavery. Um, yeah, it's, it's really in interesting. This idea of ownership is absolutely key, you know, if, and again, um, you know, the difference between gifting and, and a con, um, dif gifting and, and I know this isn't the topic of this particular, um, situation of, of this particular chapter, but you know, this ownership that someone else can be owned as a person just takes you down a completely different path. <laughs> that that property can be sanctioned by a state. And again, you know, this is a, a one that's coming from the yarns and knowing this is indigenous knowledge. And if any time I reference these yarns, I'm talking about sand talk and conversations that I had about indigenous knowledge structure. So there's a real synergy happening here and they're specifically talking about Graeber's book so there's a loop here that I'm just making clear that I am actually talking about indigenous cultures I'm talking about reflection of the past into the present and what we can do now so it's absolutely just a, a straight parallel conversation um, so ownership is really important property is really important because it divides communities um, along lines where you know you can't actually recover that because you actually get people fighting each other. You can construct it where you divide people in a way that they will fight each other and solve your problem. And then you just step in and fill the gap, you know? <laughs> um, 
So when you allow people into power who can do that, and it can be power like economies, you know, where, you know, you've got these families that own the globe. It's like, where did that come from? We're not even playing the game that we thought we were playing. <laughs> we're playing somebody else's game entirely. And it's not actually aligned to states at all. It's like, oh, that was so last century or last millennia. We own the world now, you know, your serfs and your other power players are not ones who are elected. We elected them. We had a role in letting them get into play and you can't get them out really easily. So you haven't got something to fight. You just like they're hidden. You, it's a power that's distributed across the whole of the way the society works. It's a, it's a large context. It's so big. How do you fight? Name name a couple of the the um, <laughs> maybe I shouldn't. You know, name, there, there are people and families who own these choices. And when somebody tries to move against them, they've got money. They've got power. They can fix the stuff they want to fix through um, their own power corridors. You're not even fighting a seen enemy. It's not the where, where they the fix it the way they think it should be fixed, not not actually fixing it. Yeah, that is true. I I, I wonder something else from the the uh, the book. Um, I'm just going to put another quote from the book in, where our our received intellectual you know, uh, understanding of the world is that before mod the modern age, people didn't, people, you know, people were savages <laughs> and they didn't have political self-consciousness. Stupid and savages. They, and stupid savages. And they, they couldn't say, you know, <laughs> the way that we're doing politics now sucks and we, we can imagine something better and let's move to something better. So, and it's still kind of a, you know, it's, it's a thing where we haven't really thought I, or it's it's still a tough slog for our culture to say to to have what people used to have where they would have different kinds of of societies and they would consciously think about whether or not that was the way they wanted this society yeah i just put a quote in um political consciousness the ability to argue and reflect about the proper way to live which is precisely as Boehm reminds us what apes don't do this is a critique of, of sapiens. Yeah, Harari chooses to compare early humans with apes anyway. And this was what I found, found fascinating. In this way, the sapient paradox returns as a side effect of the way we read the evidence, insisting either that for countless millennia we had modern brains, but for some reason decided to live like monkeys anyway, or we had the ability to overcome our simian instincts and organize ourselves in a variety of ways, but for some equally obscure reason, we only chose ever chose one way to organize ourselves. So um, this is, and then the next goes on and says, perhaps the real reason, real question here is what it means to be a self-conscious political actor. Um, I love that. That That's a big question. What does it mean to be a self-conscious political actor? And I never thought about politics before in the, in the sense of, it's really about talking about how to live, what, what constitutes a good way to live. And, you know, then we have all these power struggles of um, when you when you say my way is better than your way and I have the muscle to back it up I'm landed gentry I conquered this land and I give it to the people I want and I've taken it from the, those who were here before and tough shit come at me I got give me everything you got I've, I've got nuclear arsenals I can do whatever the hell I want Ukraine That's really hard to come back from, isn't it? Well, in re I just finished Sand Talk last week, by the way, so I was very excited to finish it, and I'll probably go back and reread it. But because um, I have both the book and the the audio version, so this one I can listen to both or read both. You know, Tyson talks about these ancient patterns of sustainability. Um, they're they've haven't gone away and they'll be back this is where mm. humans are just going through a phase you know and we might wipe 90 percent of ourselves out but those who are left will pick up the ancient ways again i mean he doesn't say this explicitly but this, this is what i took from the book of we're waiting for those ancient patterns to re-emerge uh, I've, been, I've been watching him say that over six hours in lots of other places mm -hmm. the the fear that i have is that there was a lot 
of continuity while those cultures and ways of knowing turned up those ways of sort of intersectional being across kins and species um you know um Melanie Goodchild from Turtle Institute she's not there anymore talks about our um our relatives the beavers you know like that's a different way of living and the the places that formed those cultures were very constant even though they changed over time it was thousands of years of change yeah there were things in there that forced people to do things differently but the floods turned up slowly they didn't turn up well let me think that the whole culture evolved with time and some seasonality gave them some space so they had the reflection and they had the time and they evolved and they're very and this is the important point they were very very um associated with the land and its affordances so the culture evolved along with the land but the land is changing really fast now in our own way so if you get through if, if you if if a tribe in um the amazon and i've been there and i've seen this you know experiences bush one moment and i'm saying bush will forest one moment and no forest the next you haven't got time to adapt all of a sudden everything goes so that's one point we're changing it underneath people's feet through mining and other things harvesting trees harvesting water and drowning valleys um, in wales but we're also changing it um in um a second way and that is the diaspora so what happens then is people shift and they become not associated with the land that they used to but they their structures evolved for a land that doesn't exist. So the people move and they become spread out and they don't have a way of uniting against whatever the foe is because everything that united them is gone. It's just not relevant anymore. Or the land underneath you has changed and you stay in the space, but you have to deal with a new thing. So indigeneity, I think, has got, you know, the, the, the relationship to the land is absolutely key. You destroy the culture when you destroy the language and you destroy the um, affordances of the land on which you have built your culture, you've got a really big problem. So a lot of people um, have moved to new lands. I'm not connected to my Welsh relatives, although I can I can pull out the book that says my family goes back to the year 1088 and probably before then, but I'm not Welsh. It's like I've been told by someone who I trust that I'm not Welsh. Mm. Who am I? You know, am I Australian? No, I wasn't here 40, 70,000 years ago. I'm not Australian either, but sort of I am. It's like, who am I? How can I know if I'm not in my land, in my country? If that's been taken away, if I'm in the city, I'm a different person. I have another quote, this one from <clears throat> Bio Akomalafe. Colonization might involve the stealing of a people's wealth but it's not the central idea. Colonization is about reinventing the frames of reference of a people so that mm. they, the way they make sense of things changes. Colonization will say, the relationship you have with that mountain no longer makes sense. That mountain is a thing to you now. So blow it up and build a highway there. That yeah. feels very relevant to what you were just saying. Mm. Um, we have rapid colonization, which doesn't just show up and wipe out people's cultures in a short period of time, but is now making major, uh, or in the Anthropocene, we now have major um, effects on the environment, which are speeding up and, and creating major changes in the land. So yeah, it's going to be a hell of a ride for the next few centuries, I think. Oh, absolutely. And the very relationality that we need to call on to redo things has been disrupted in foundational ways. You know, the and the differences so um english doesn't have the noun no it has nouns more than verbs and verbs are really important in being in relation to your environment in your relation to other people so there you are in relation to that's a good example you know i'm relationing with you <laughs> at the moment well we are um but we're doing it in a distributed way you're not in my country and i'm not in yours so you can never understand my country and where i am because you can come and visit it. I know Pete has. Um, I'm, starting, I'm standing in Ngunnawal country on the side of Mount Taylor. It actually means something to someone in Canberra. Pete, wouldn't, my, Pete, I showed Pete the view from where I go for my walk. He showed me his views. And I'm thinking, oh, there's actually a lot of similarity between those two. But we've got different things that will bite and eat you. 
um, but at least that just the sharing of the image helped. But you know, the in relation to, we're in relation to each other online, but we're not in relation to each other in country. And so my navigation points will never be yours, but verbs are really important. And English doesn't have, it's not a verb based language. There's a word in, um, in, a, in an, one indigenous Australian language that says to be a river. I can look at a river and it's an object. When it's an object, I can do something to it. If I look at another person and we're going back to slavery here and that person is an object because my words let them make them into an object, I can do whatever I want. It's like you're an it. I'm a, I'm a person and you're an it. This tree is an it, not a person. And in indigenous language, I'm looking at it as a person, you know, that has personhood. Absolutely, I've heard those words from someone in water, in a water environment. Like they can have a different conversation between themselves about the river and the river's right to exist. And it's different to law, you know. So we've got foundational problems at the level of language, you know. I, I would love to make, I would love, here's a challenge. I would love to, in our world, agree on turning nouns into verbs. Just make an agreement. Oh, that's that new verb. <laughs> and use it in our language and see what it changes about how we think about things. So anyway, my point is that these ind indigenous cultures that we're talking about had different languages and the affordances of those. And um, I can't say the word Ashinabewin. Um, it's a Canadian um, indigenous language uh, um, and it has more verbs. So they can do more things that include verbs that don't turn things into objects and property. And when you've got tools like that, then we can shift some things like, you know, let's invent some new words. That would be cool. I would like to come back to what Ken was saying. You know, this would be an interesting few hundred years. Oh. And by all, for all practical purposes, we don't have a few hundred years uh, based on current trend lines. So you wonder what happened, for example, the Khmer, right? The Khmer had a 600 year empire in the Cambodia, what's today Cambodia, Thailand, Vietnam, fascinating. You know, and, I mean, I, I uh, was traveling through the area there and, and an amazing civilization that I was never aware of until I started working in Asia. Um, and they basically uh, destroyed the environment. I mean, the, the assumption is that they, uh, their uh, soil got lost, you know, they be, became infertile and the entire thing collapsed. So you, you, you sort of wonder what prevented them from um, shifting course and, and recognizing the danger they are in. Um, now there are other civilizations that survived, right? I mean, there are. Uh, I mean, you look at the Europeans. I mean, they're, they're, look at Japan. Japan has been for thousands of years on this little island of theirs, and they didn't destroy their their, uh, their lands capacity to produce food and feed themselves, right? So what's the difference? You know, how, mm. What kind of adaptations have taken place in the way that they were? Uh, collectively uh, looking at their form of governance and the way they interacted with the environment. And I think to understand that, you know, is, is for us today critical because we're global, right? I mean, you know, what, what uh, used to be an environment around the Khmer, uh, that's today the world, right? I mean, there is no more uh, the regional uh, the differentiation here, we're all putting it into the same air, into the same water. Uh, so that, that's, that's uh, uh, I mean, you, you have other examples, you know, the Incas, I mean, there the, the are other, the civil, many civilizations that collapsed because uh, they destroyed the, the regenerative capacity of the environment mm. uh, to feed themselves. So that, you know, and I don't know if that pops up in the book in a later chapter, but uh, you know, how does this collective intelligence uh, perpetuate itself, you know, which is so strong to Chinese? I mean, the Chinese went through amazing uh, periods of starvation, right? Which is why the Chinese are saying we eat everything that turns its back to the sun. You know? um, and they do, <laughs> snails, rats, you name it. And 
and but but they they made it through some horrendous times and they made a virtue out of living through horrendous times right mm -hmm. uh, i mean you wouldn't believe what the stuff that i've seen but there are actually some pretty refined recipes for rats you know, you know dogs and snakes and what have you yeah. but they, they you know they never lost their cultural perspectives to uh um to just make the, the best of, of what they have been able to work with. So when you look at civilizations that lasted and survived versus those that, that vanished, right? it would be really interesting to understand what happened to them uh, from, from a collective leadership perspective. I, th I think there's also a cultural element there too. So um, there's, a, again, a point um, that's made by Tyson and Dave and others around the role of culture and how culture actually turns up in times of diversity, uh, sorry, uh, adversity, like, you know, slaves who sing to, to do work that is really hard, but they, they build something around it. There's lots and lots of examples given. Um, so culture isn't just a sort of, oh, wow, we've got some spare time, we'll do something fun. It's actually part of the way people live their lives. It's not a, and it's not all about pretty and happy things. Sometimes it's about rising, well, not even about rising, it's about staying, staying together and doing things in a way. There's almost something about making different choices, um, being obvious because culture just allows you to, to do something with your environment that's not extractive and that is positive in keeping you together. Um, but there's also another point I want to make here about noticing. So I think... Um, I'm hearing from Indigenous people about the importance of just sitting and looking at a frog and what the frog does and how the frog fits in with the water and, and noticing that and a culture that allows that to be noticed and versus that actually being pushed out. So if I'm just going to sit and look at a frog for the day, some people would say, but why aren't you earning money and why aren't you doing X, Y and Z? No, I'm looking at the frog. Well, I'm not even saying that I'm looking at the frog. I'm just being in the space. So I think there's some, there may be something in these cultures that have pushed out that time or pushed out that culture of um, just being creative or pushed out the ability to be different and look at a frog. Um, I'm thinking Guy Ratani and Perming, queer, Perming queering, um, queering Permaculture. You should Google him, Klaus. I think you'll find him an interesting character. Um, I'll put it in the chat this guy and he's just creating a space where and he was one of the people who was looking at the frogs because there was a lot of water floating around eastern Australia he just and I know other people who do this they just sit with nature and they observe it and they can see which way it's going they observe the frog as a harbinger of things working well or badly and um, they've got this really deep attachment to whether it's actually trending um, a way that's good or not. And um, Indigenous people often say the land needs us. The land needs us to burn it or to do something with it to ha to um, be a, a proper, um, what's the word, starts with S, when you're, um, thank you, when you're stewarding the land. So the land is not just doing it, the people are working with the land in a positive way you know, the, the permaculture and you develop the, the frog, frog watching skills is part of how you just do things. You just sit sometimes and look at stuff and you figure that that stuff isn't working a good direction. So you stay connected to it. Whereas if you can pretend that it's an object and you can't, you don't actually have to sit with it and you just do stuff to it and you don't listen back, that listening to the land is actually part, I think, of and the ability to do it is what we're losing, to just sit with the stuff and observe it and and see how it all fits. We, we're losing models of complexity, if I wanted to put it one way. We're losing them hands over fist as we make things that destroy and pull it apart. I can go to thousands and thousands of places in my country, Australia, not forever, but where land, nothing's changed over time. No one has done anything to it except for, you know, it's just evolved. It just is. But how, can, how easily can you do that in Britain or New York? Could you find any part of New York that hasn't been done over by people. I, I reckon New York State or New York City. Well, yeah, a big difference. Yeah, thank you. The state, yes, you might, 
but that would still be a challenge because it's a pretty expensive piece of real estate. <laughs> oh, you can get up there in the Adirondacks and find lots of wild spaces. It's beautiful, quite, quite amazing. But they've oh. got to stay there because otherwise we can't come back and look at those models of complexity and see how interwoven they are. Well, and we're losing the places that give us this ability to look at complexity and you can't construct complexity. You can't design complexity, it's got to evolve. You're reminding me of another quote from, from uh, Bio where he says, my, uh, my elders teach that the world is alive. And when you know that you sit down and shut up once in a while, which I just yeah. love, you know, because oh. um, I'm a big fan of going out in the woods and sitting down and shutting up and just being quiet and observing. You know, it's the most healing thing I do for myself. But I want to go back to something Klaus said. Um, yeah, I, I'm curious, do you make a distinction between, between culture, society and civilization, Klaus? I don't know how you would split that apart um, because culture and civilization are totally intertwined. I would say culture is, is probably in the hierarchy further up and then and which culture defines the way it wants to organize itself, which we then would define as civilization. Um, so if you look at the Plains Indians, for example, or the North Northeast Woodland Indians. They did not have a quote civilization. They didn't have their buildings were were semi permanent. You know, in many cases they they were nomadic people, or they they lived in longhouses which were made of wood and had to constantly be rebuilt. So, and and the Europeans did not see them as a civilized people, but they had a civilization as far as I'm concerned. So I'm just curious how we're, I want to make sure we're using the word in the same way. I just want to see what your what your definition is on that. Well, I would argue that they they had a form of civilization which we just don't necessarily recognize as okay. such because it's so far away from from the the uh, organizational construct right that we and define here. But that civilization you know, was to uh, be here in the summer and there in the winter and mm -hmm. you know and, and organize their communal living uh, in certain ways. Right. Culture, I see more as the spirituality. You know, it, you know, and, and when you when you look at old cultures that have survived, you know, take the Japanese, but don't take the Germans or the Spaniards. Or, you know, um, they they have a way of sense making. You know, in that that defers to elders, that defers to. Uh, what we would call today subject matter experts, you know, to the wise people and so on. And I think that has something to do with the survivability of these uh, cultures, civilizations, you know, to, to, to go into a deep thinking uh, mode and to, to come towards consensus, you know, this, the, the, the consensus shaping of, of uh, these established cultures. Um, that, that's that's uh, um, I, mean, I, I don't know what else would have made the difference between, let's say, the Khmer, you know, or the Incas and, mm -hmm. and the Japanese and the Chinese and you know, the Europeans. I mean, look at the British, you know. Um, so they, they, I mean, the British as authoritarian as their um, their royalty and so so was. Um, they had a deep respect for, always have a, a deep respect for a talent, right? I mean, you, the, the, your knighting basically, uh, basically is a recognition of having made a contribution to the, the society. So you're being elevated, you know, into, mm -hmm. uh, into the court and so on. So they, they are, uh, I think culture spawns uh, survival mechanism. Now that that allow the adaptation to changing circumstances. Thanks. I just want to make sure. Sorry, when you go ahead. Um, I think there's an important difference here between society and culture. So just saying that some of the people who don't respect sociologists and even some of the sociologists themselves say that they'd like to actually reinvent that word and for it to be something different because it doesn't work. Um, and a society is different to a culture. So if you look at James Carr's book, Finite and Infinite Games, um, he really di he disambiguates between society and culture and society has a lot more of the governance structure and such in it. And the culture actually ri rides between the different boundaries, it crosses boundaries. 
so um yeah, I would refer that, and and it's a hole in our discussion. We you, you were talking very much about cultures and civilizations, but societies are a different cut. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, he he spends quite a lot of time in in um, finite and infinite games describing the difference. But I think the main point really is that formal structures are part of society. They're sort of agreed in a a more um, governed way and the cultures sort of evolve and you can do something grungy between the sections um, that doesn't actually have to have um, a a specified way of doing it it's just emergent and I think that's a really important point to make they're not the same thing and it was a gap in our conversation too coming back to gaps Mm. the civilization culture thing I think is a really great level to be talking at it but what's society should we be looking for making a society or should we sort of like bypass that and do collapse things a little bit and just look at cultures? What do you see the difference? What do you see as the difference between society and civilization? Yeah. If you look, if you look in the chat, Pete just put some stuff in there between culture and society. Um, I, I think the, of it kind of as hierarchy or size, you know, culture is kind of the bubbly stuff that happens and then that turns into society and then that turns into civilization at, at larger mm-hmm. scales and longer time scales. I, I think Cass would absolutely disagree with you. He sees culture and society as having an overlap, but society um, not not being an ascension of culture, I would put it the other way around. Society. I'm not sure I would, I would say that I said ascension. <laughs> you said it Um, can become society so there's a linearity here is it a circular thing one actually influences the other culture is more fuzzy and society is a little less fuzzy and civilization is is even a little less fuzzy maybe no that's that's a good way of putting it the thing that got me in the civilization was the urbanization and social stratification which is a lot about what what dawn of everything is pointing towards you know of we have that social stratification i'm more important than you are um i can tell you what to do and then um we eventually as we come towards uh forward in 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 uh towards modern day we end up with with a situation where we have built all these this gigantic infrastructure on land that's constantly changing on the, and is going to change dramatically in the next uh, few decades thanks to you know inundation and drought and floods and um, so the, there's kind of fragile uh, civilizations and anti-fragile civilizations yes yes and so you know I agree that the next few hundred years is going to be interesting because this civilization ain't going to make it we're watching the end of it it is just falling apart in front of our eyes that doesn't mean that there aren't many good things that can be saved from it and carried forward and i would call that elements of culture which will be carried forward by certain segments of society um but i think you know i've heard many different uh speculations on this some people say there'll be a third of humanity will die off immediately a third will die off slowly and there'll be a third that will survive. Other people say we could actually wipe out 90% of humanity, which would take us back to about a billion people, which was 1800. It took until the year 1800 for a billion people to show up on the planet. A billion people is still a lot of fucking people. I do not worry that the world is ending. The world has ended many times before and yet people are still here. I think what we're living through is Mm -hmm. a transition between one great era and another. And I don't know what the next year looks like in terms of greatness. I think it's probably going to carry with it enormous toxicity. There's, you know, as as lowlands are inundated by seawater and, and other types of flooding, infrastructures of, of Superfund sites and, and waste lands and feedlots that have these gigantic, you know, methane pools of, of it's just, it's going to be a fucking mess. And there's going to be a lot of poisoning of the environment. Um, but people are going to adapt. There, there, there will still be people here. How they adapt, how well they survive is largely dependent upon how well they can prepare now. How much can we, how much can we avoid the really bad shit? Um, and so I'm not trying to save our civilization. I'm just trying to save what's what's worth remembering, which interestingly goes back to indigenous memory. I saw David Suzuki speak at Dominican University one day, and, and he had this picture of um, Wendy, how do you say the the Bad name is Ayers Rock, but the indigenous name is Uluru. How do you say that? Yeah, Uluru. Yeah, Uluru. Uluru. 
the emphasis at the end. Yeah. So he had, he had this picture of these two Aboriginal people sitting there, and in front of them was laid out all of these insects. These are all edible insects. And Suzuki said, if these people disappear, the knowledge of insects that will keep you alive in times of famine will go with them. This is a this is a treasure house. This is something that really yeah. needs to be preserved, right? And most of our culture today in modern Western global North culture would go, I'm never going to freaking eat an insect. But if you were hungry and it was the only thing between you and starvation, you'd eat a ton of them. So we need to start re- evaluating, remembering, reassessing, reintegrating this ancient knowledge that's been carried on. As far as we know, Aboriginal people in Australia have been around for at least 50,000 years, probably longer. That's a continuous civilization, a continuous culture, society. They got to have tons of stuff to teach us. They do. But, you know, I, I keep on coming back to how close I am to this stuff now. It's absolutely fascinating. And I'm, I'm encouraging people to really in general, to really double down on the value of these conversations that we're having, because you can learn very quickly when you do. So this slowing down to speed up is really, really important as a concept. Um, The stopping and listening and watching and not um, denying the value that is actually in front of you in the words and the things that you see, like the range of insects. The thing is, though, that, and I come back to your word of built, we're actually building out our ability to be able to observe those things. We're building out the ability to be with those people because those people are not us and I'm in a city and we're actually building the structure of our governance into our cities. So I live high on high land. If a st- if, if my, my house is ever flooded, the whole world is in a big problem because <laughs> I live on quite high ground in a dry place, you know, I'd be an island. But my point is that, the, you, you know, there are places in my own city I don't go, not because they're dangerous, because I don't have the habit, and I'm thinking, um, you know, Bordeaux and Habitus. I don't have the habitus of passing through those places. My stories don't include those places. And my place is structured so that I don't go there because it's designed that way. It's convenient for me to be where I am. Um, so we're actually building in the lack of circulation locally in our own environments that will allow us to notice those things. However, I am very lucky in that I can actually, um, I can go and observe nature and it's a, um, 80 meters away from where I live. I can go and sit under a tree all day if I wished. Um, I could do that. I'm trying not to do that because I need, you know, I'm, I'm hooked into an economy that says I should actually be working instead of sitting underneath the tree. But I do actually fit both into my world. So anyway, the structure of our cities is keeping us from seeing each other and seeing different models of the way things are. And the minute in in a place like Australia where we are looking at to save the world, and this is a conversation that's happening in my city as we have elections, we are going electric, which means we need to have all these minerals, which means we have to go and mine all these minerals, which means we're having all these open cut mines in Australia to feed the batteries that will save the world is like, okay, can we just come one level up and say, let's actually keep the country, reduce the need for moving around, but still notice our own communities and work with those. Then I don't feel like I have to go running around in a four wheel drive to some other person's country and I can respect my own. It's like, it changes the whole solution looking. We're not trying to go electric. I'm doing with less, I get exercised you know, can you see how that would work if I was just local? I don't feel like I have to go to London anymore. But the irony of all of that is that I love spending time with you guys, which means I have to have a laptop, which uses. <laughs> <laughs> you can see how this is. In order to get there, I've got to go through the destruction of of mining my own land and destroying it like the soil pits in um, Wales, which have changed the landscape. How do you come back from that amount of change? Now you can't see what it used to be. You can't ever go back. So there's a lot of destruction, as you say. And that could work it in uh, uh, what, and and, um, another thing I've noticed here is the very people who could contribute to learning how to regenerate the land are running away from that because it's not their value system. So I've watched young, deeply talented young people 
soil scientists decide that they're not going to work for the mining companies because it's not their value system. So they're going like to the periphery, they're leaving the big obvious hole in the middle, as in we will mine, because mining is part of how Australia makes money and we need the, the things for batteries, you know, so we can have our electric cars. They're running away from that conversation because they hate it so much. The young people who could help us learn how to recover from poison soil are not wanting to have anything to do with it because it's not their value system. We're not confronting that reality that we're going to need. And how hard would that be? But I could enter that race. I thought about it yesterday. The stuff I could do in that area, but I hate having to deal with the reality of it's not what I want to do. It's icky. I, I would rather do something more comfortable, but maybe that's what I'd choose to do is to get some of those conversations up because it's there in Australia at the moment. Hey, Kakadu, we're coming underneath you. <laughs> Take what we need. Leave what you can't. Leave the mess. I'd like to uh, uh, start wrapping up. And and normally we would have kind of a reflection on on how the meeting went and and um, but I I don't know if this was kind of an, an odd meeting we had people cycling in and out and I think we can still reflect on how it went uh, you know uh, I'm sorry to see Gil go as soon as I got here I thought wow I must have offended him and he's I'm out of here if Ken's here, you know, um, actually, I, he's the reason I'm the reason he got here because he he texted me saying, where's the link? I know you sent it to me, but please resend it. <laughs> um, it was challenging for me coming in late. I really hated to be late, but I didn't have any choice because I have another client call at 11 on Thursday. So I won't be able to join at all. So I thought better better to come for a little bit of the meeting than at all. Um, I just... I, I'm appreciative of everybody here. I love to hear the different perspectives. And, um, you know, uh, I think it's, it's for me personally, I just get so much more being part of a book circle talking about a book than if I just read it on my own. And especially with, you know, Wendy being there in Australia and and, uh, and the fact that, that class, have you read Sand Talk? I haven't. Okay, but I, I Pete, you've read it, haven't you? Parts of it, I haven't read the whole thing. Yeah, so at least three of us are familiar with it. And, just, and it feels so complimentary with Dawn of Everything. So this is very rich for me. I, I appreciate that. Um, so for me, I, 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 even though it was disjointed and, and partial for me, I still felt a, a strong resonance with the people here and being being part of it. So just it affirms for me. So I, I, liked, I liked the meeting. Thanks, Ken. I, I feel that way too. I, you know, I appreciate that we got to talk about the book and the, I, I, um, so I can take away a, a little bit of psychic pain or something from not reading the chapter at all. Um, I did skim it uh, towards the beginning of the meeting, um, but um, I, I will, <laughs> I will not do that again. I'm, I'm for myself. Um, I started going back to the chapter and I'm just noticing what, um, what was said, I think it was you, Ken, about listening versus reading and how I interact differently with the source material and my ability to recall it. And I've got pretty good recall. So in some ways, I'm sort of disappointed with myself in not getting through it twice. Um, so once listening to it and walking in country, and I'm using that word country with a big C in Australia, I was walking in the bush as I listened to it. So it's sort of embedded in me. And that's my style with these books. Um, so I lose, I lose my ability to understand where I am in the book because it's got a wholeness about it that I've created through embodiment and how I've consumed the book. And the other thing I'm noticing is the absolute insistence that I place on the other things that I've done in parallel with this, which is looking at the yarns between Indigenous people across the planet, you know, Wales and Australia, and the points that are coming up in there and Graeber's book was that conversation was what drew me to Graeber, you know, because they said, you should read this book. And I did. <laughs> well, I've read it and heard it. So I can't but 
I, I can't avoid drawing parallels between my parallel streams of what I'm listening to at the moment, which is braiding sweetgrass, um, socio narratology, um, sand talk, listening to quotes from the next version of the next uh, follow on of sand talk, which um, Tyson does in these yarns. But I'm very influenced by the conversation that's happening in parallel and my intersections with those and those people and their ideas. It, 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 it makes them very easy to rise and see things across. I don't think I could just read one book and pay attention to one book. Tyson says specifically he avoids doing that. And I understand why. The other thing that Wendy's doing right now, um, and and she's described this a couple of times, but it doesn't it doesn't land <laughs> unless Sorry. you really think about it. Um, uh, she's literally got uh, recordings of four yarns with Tyson and Dave Snowden and, and other folks, um, and she's listened to the trans listened to the recordings multiple times, corrected the transcripts. Um, which were done, done out by a service, but then she has to go in and make sure that it's exactly right. Um, and then she's been pulling out the, the meaty quotes for that and assembling those. So we can take all of that and, and work it into a website. So Whoa, when, when you, do we get access to that? I want that. <laughs> yeah, as soon as I get on the call, I'll be back on it. Um, the, the other thing to note is that I'm also doing that the person who's paying for that insists that I'm not the person who knows the stuff. So I'm trying to handle the material in a deeply reverential way, um, which is in keeping with their value system, um, which is not being the knower, but to be an observer in the system and let the system learn itself. And Tyson has come into that, um, managing each of these conversations in a way that they've agreed and I haven't heard about that. So there is someone who's sort of facilitating the conversation and I have to make a summary. So I, I can collapse 60, sorry, 30 pages of transcript um, to five or six pages, but I'm doing it like a screen play, like, you know, and this poor person walks in and there seems to be, oh, I'm observing that the boys are talking mainly for these first three pages, which they do. <laughs> There's definitely a gender thing turning up. So I'm making observations about um, the passage without saying this means X. I'm just noticing and gathering and not interpreting, but knowing what I know about socio-narratology um, from a book by Arthur Frank, um, which is brilliant, by the way, I would recommend everyone reads this book. Um, Arthur W. Frank, I think it is. Um, you've got to work out how this stuff influences our stories and how we then intersect with all the other things that we're intersecting with. Um, but anyway, yeah, they'll be published shortly and I would encourage us to do more of this and work out the most efficient way of doing it, which is what Pete and I are doing together. So then we can come back to these conversations and learn from them quickly because we're just going round in circles. <laughs> I have planted a seed literally on the back of the fact that I need to experiment with growing things. My step towards permaculture. Klaus, <laughs> thank you because I will learn from having that, that little conversation with trying to grow something. So you've got to do something with this stuff that we're passing through, because I think that's the biggest problem I see is that we're not coming back to it and learning quickly. We're learning slowly by failing and multiple failings that aren't joined up and not a healthy way to go <laughs> to stop, you know, collapse. My plant dies, I've got to put another plant in and work out quite quickly what it was that I should have done the first time with my new set of circumstances. And yeah, that's a challenge. So intersectionality, verbs. Klaus, how was the meeting for you? Yeah, <clears throat> remember from, from the starting point, I was saying, I was talking about setting up a hypothesis and for shaping a lens through which you know we look at this material and this is really I, I think every comment you hear me make you know is is leading back to this lens and my lens here really is who is this animal hope you're homo sapien who are we really you know how are we shaped how, how are we formed 
And what examples do we have through our evolutionary path that could guide us to, uh, to functioning in today's uh, challenging world and environment? Yeah. And so, because I, I, I see we are so threatened, right? Uh, um, in, in, in a very immediate future. And I mean, like right now, today, right? I mean, you have uh, uh, the, uh, catastrophic weather systems in South Africa, uh, in India, in Pakistan. I mean, it's going, it's happening in multiple locations simultaneously. So we, it is, it is, it is out there, you know. And uh, um, so I'm, I'm really looking at where is this going? Um, you know, where, where, where are we forming in conversations? You know, like OGME type of conversations, and in in groups that are that are coming together and how can you how can you um, uh, shape uh, um, mindsets or, or participate in mindsets that are constructive and looking into into the future here so that's sort of where where uh, where i'm coming from and then you see my comments uh, always coming back to you know what does this mean for us today and with this, I have to run because my with my garage door repairman is here. So I did right, see this long. Klaus. Thanks. Hi, Klaus. Take care. Thanks. So with that, there's an uh, ending of sorts. Yeah, that's a good uh, natural end. Uh, let me stop the recording. Uh, if I can, I guess it's here. See. So